All right, well, thanks very much for having me here. Uh, that's me, Tom Stace, um, and I'm a, a physicist, so I work on uh, quantum information and quantum computing, mostly thinking about gadgets that people might uh, use in the future to, to, to build a quantum computer. Uh, I'm at the University of Queensland in the uh, Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence in um, Engineered Quantum Systems, uh, which has this, this logo. Some people think this looks like a toilet roll <laughs> being unwound. Um, uh, and so I was asked uh, by Arjun to uh, give a, a sort of an overview of what's happening in, in quantum computing. Uh, and at the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some uh, software open source projects that, uh, that people in physics are, are developing. And, and maybe some people here will, will be interested in, in participating. I should say first that, uh, that physics is, uh, is th at the heart of, of computing. So nowadays, it's very easy to think of, of computers as sort of abstract uh, idealizations of some information processor, but, but really inside everything it is, uh, of course, physical hardware that's driving it. And there was uh, some very notable computer scientists and mathematicians and physicists over the uh, first part of the 20th century and even back into the 19th century, which, uh, which really developed the, the information theory behind modern computers. So I'm sure you're, you're familiar with Alan Turing, who is a, a um, information theorist in Cambridge uh, in, the, in the first half of last century. Uh, John von Neumann was a very influential uh, 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 chap who uh, was, was principally a, a physicist, but he developed some of the very first computing systems uh, in order to solve physics problems, often in a, in a military context, but that's, that's still true. A lot of the, the military uh, continues to fund a lot of uh, work in information theory. And I'll mention John Bell, Richard Feynman as well, who are both uh, high energy physicists who um, had very important contributions to make to uh, what we now consider, what we now call quantum information and, and quantum computation. And of, of course, uh, one can't mention information theory now without thinking about uh, Tim Berners-Lee who, who, who developed the, the World Wide Web. I saw an interview with him where the title on the TV screen was simply listed as uh, web developer. <laughs> of course, the web developer. And, and he, he started off at, uh, at CERN as well. He was uh, writing software for, for the particle accelerator. Um, this is the state of the art in, uh, to, so to begin with, I'm gonna sort of go through the, uh, the, the, the general idea of, of quantum, inf quantum computing. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about quantum mechanics. So some of you may have, uh, may have heard, heard of quantum mechanics. Some of you may have studied it and, uh, and, uh, or read popular science books about it. And I wanna to communicate to you today some of the, the strange things about quantum mechanics um, that, that are, are really quite counterintuitive. But uh, to begin with, this is, this is a, a supercomputer from a couple of decades ago, the Cray. And here's a, a, a supercomputer now, which you can walk around with in your pocket. Maybe this is a couple of years old uh, by now. But in fact, in many ways, this, this gadget is more powerful than this gadget. It has, uh, on board, it has uh, a, a, an array of sensors uh, that, with which it can uh, measure the state of the environment, its position, uh, its, uh, um, the, the electromagnetic environment, um, and it can even interact with the environment. Of course, it can make noises and uh, you can use it as a phone, most prosaically, uh, and it can, can in fact vibrate as well, can't it? So, um, and here's some of the, the guts shrinking what, what was formerly a, a, a room-sized computer into something that, that uh, people carry around uh, ubiquitously. These are some of the sensors that, that live inside a, a modern smartphone. There's, uh, there's electromagnetic sensors, GPS, uh, it can, can sense magnetic fields, it can, the screen of course is a, a sensor. Now this, this uh, part here has been replaced by an image recognition gadget. Uh, and there's all sorts of mechanical sensors inside it to, to measure accelerations and so on. And if you, if you zoom in on some of those sensors, they're, they're, they occupy length scales that are, are really quite small, microns or uh, fractions thereof. So here's some pictures of the accelerometers, the mechanical accelerometers that, that sit inside an iPhone and, and uh, let it uh, measure accelerations. And as you zoom in on them, you see these structures that are incredibly small. So here's 100 micrometers, so that's a 10 to the minus 4 of a metre. So these, these things are at the scale of 10 microns. 
And if you zoom in further, you see these mechanical uh, components, which are, which are really test masses that, that, that move in response to forces applied to the, the device. So the, the, the uh, mechanical sensors that live inside an iPhone are starting to occupy length scales that are, at the, at, are comparable to red blood cells. Okay? So a red blood cell is a, is a micron in, in, in size. Now, if you extrapolate the the the, uh, the, gro the well the, the shrinking in, in scale from early uh, well two decade old supercomputers through to uh, iPhones, what we might end up with in two decades is is technologies, electronic technologies, and mechanical technologies that that live at the scale of uh, that work at the scale of red blood cells, and maybe maybe we might have uh, some sort of vision about what we might pack into uh, tiny uh, devices. And the reason that, that, uh, that we can do that, we can, we can envision such a, a future, is because there is a lot of room at the bottom. So this is a famous quote by Richard Feynman, who won a Nobel Prize in, in physics. He was a, one, of the, uh, one of the stars of, um, of physics for his generation. And he noted that when you write down the equations that govern a quantum system, the number of equations there are scales like uh, an exponential in the number of particles. So if you have two, two particles interacting, there's uh, something like four equations. If you have uh, three particles, there's eight equations you need to solve. And the number of equations themselves grows exponentially in the number of particles. So, so merely solving for the, the behaviour of a, of a collection of, of quantum particles really requires a, a, a very large number of equations. And he, he realised that, uh, that in some sense nature is simulating a problem that's incredibly hard to solve on a conventional classical computer. So you can get a computer like this to solve a selection of differential equations, but if you ask it to solve some number of equations which is growing exponentially, it will eventually run out of, uh, run out of puff. But, and and he, furthermore, he noticed that uh, given the electronics of the day, and, uh, and it even holds true now, the there's, there's a huge amount of space between what we, what we do at the moment and what nature is capable of. So, for example, this is a, this is a fundamental limit to, to the power of a computer in, measured in units of, uh, of heat, really. So, when, uh, when the computer forgets a bit of information, there's a, there's a principle called Landau's principle which says that a, a, a minimum amount of heat must be generated. So, this, this is probably a little bit warm at the moment, not yet. This, this is. So the reason it's hot is because it's dissipating energy. And fundamentally, when you erase a single bit, classical bit of information, uh, Landau's principle says that you need to generate a fixed amount of heat. It's related to the entropy generated. And, and the amount of heat goes like this. It's Boltzmann's constant, which is a fundamental constant, times the temperature at which it's already uh, running, times log of two, which is a number of order one. And if you just work that out for a, a gadget like this at room temperature, it tells you that you need to dissipate about 10 to the minus 20 joules per bit that you uh, are trying to forget, essentially. Now, if you imagine processing uh, at the rate of a terabyte per second, then the CPU power requirements, given this fundamental limit, is something like 10 to the minus 8 watts. Okay, so that would be to process a terabyte per second. But uh, a typical desktop computer can process, say, a gigabyte per second, uh, that's typical bus speeds, um, but, and the CPU power consumption is of the order of tens or hundreds of, of watts. Okay, so, so there's a great uh, margin between this number and, and this number. 10 to the 10 or 11 or 12 uh, orders of magnitude, 10 or 11 or 12 orders of magnitude between what the fundamental dissipation of power uh, that, that uh, laws of physics impose on us and what, in fact, real computers uh, do. And so, if you could exploit those orders of magnitude between, between the fundamental uh, limit and what we have at the moment, maybe you can do all sorts of interesting things. But it turns out when you go to the bottom, when you ask what happens at the smaller scales, the world becomes quite strange. It becomes quantum mechanical. And quantum mechanics is characterised by the physics at very short scales, the physics at cold temperatures and the physics at low energies. And so what I'm showing here is a, 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 a micrograph of a, of a little chip that uh, was made in Harvard by some col collaborators of mine there, where uh, these, this is a, a, a surface and uh, beneath the surface there's a, a, a two-dimensional metal essentially. 
And that two-dimensional metal can be controlled by these electronic gates here. Now, I won't go into the details, but essentially these gates allow you to deplete electrons from that metal that's underneath them. And you can see I've put these two little blue dots. What, if, you, if you tune the voltages on these, these metallic electrodes uh, uh, appropriately, you can drive this system so that there can be a single electron localised on this site here or on this site here. And that electron can be controlled, its position can be controlled, you can, you can uh, change the voltage on these two gates so that the electron prefers to sit on one side or prefers to sit on the other side. And you can literally count electrons out of this double well, as it's called, this, this two, uh, two little puddles where, where, the electron, where the electronic charge can be. You can count electrons out, and I won't go into the details again, but this is a, 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 an experimental uh, result showing the number of electrons in the left-hand side and the number of electrons in the right-hand side. So 2, 2 in this region says there's two, literally two electrons here and two electrons there, and that's stable in this region. And as you change voltages, you count out electrons until you get to a point where there's none. So no electrons are stored in, this, in, these, in either of these two puzzle, puddles, and uh, if you change the voltage back up a bit, you can, you can push an electron into the right-hand side, that's this state here, or an electron into this state here. So really people electronically can control single electrons microscopically. Now, the same, same kind of uh, thing happens in, in nature. So this is a, a series of length scales associated with plants. Here's 10 centimetres, you can see leaves, and then as you zoom in on a leaf, all the way down to the biochemical scale. And, and uh, at this scale, photosynthesis, is, this is the scale at which photosynthesis uh, occurs, light being turned into free charges with which a plant uh, uh, metabolises and produces uh, things that are useful for, for its own survival. And, and quantum mechanics really does uh, come into its own uh, at, this, at this length scale. So up here we've got leaves which behave in, in the same way as everyday objects. You know, a leaf and a micro, microphone aren't too different. If I, if I fling one or the other, they'll crash into something. But at the, and so, so their, their physics is really described by the laws of classical mechanics, Newton's laws. But down here, the physics of photosynthesis and so on, like uh, the physics of the, the electronic charges on this double dot electronic device, follow the laws of quantum mechanics. So if you can get, if you can, uh, if you can push down these orders of magnitude between what uh, conventional computers uh, are capable of and what the laws of physics uh, suggest that we can do, you reach a regime where we well, need to start thinking about quantum mechanics. So what is what does quantum mechanics let you do? Well, this is this is a sort of prelude to the to the rest of the talk. It's really giving you the punchline. So if you can control things at the quantum level, then what you can, uh, you can end up doing is building a quantum computer. Uh, and quantum computers have a, a, a few killer, killer apps, and I'll touch on those uh, briefly. There's not very many killer apps, but there are certainly some. Uh, and also, uh, you can, you can uh, build quantum communication devices. So it turns out that with uh, quantum mechanics, you can build a, uh, essentially an encryption protocol that lets you perfectly enc encrypt information in a way that's uh, uh, provably secure according to the laws of physics. Okay, so you know that uh, encryption that you use on the internet at the moment, in principle, can be broken if you've got a sufficiently powerful classical computer. Quantum. Uh, quantum information has shown, has provides us with a mechanism which lets you uh, generate provably secure uh, communications channels. There's, there's another branch of quantum technologies that, uh, that people are interested in, including myself, which is uh, thinking about what kind of sensors and uh, measurements can you make when you take advantage of quantum mechanics. And it turns out that quantum mechanics lets you do uh, certain kinds of measurements in a way that's fundamentally more precise than, than, uh, than classical sensors. So there's applications in medicine and uh, in, in GPS, for instance, where one can, can uh, push the sensitivity of, of uh, measurement devices up if you can uh, take a advantage of quantum mechanics. And in fact, one of the uh, first applications where quantum, quantum uh, uh, quantum sensors are being used is in detecting gravitational waves. So there's interferometers around, uh, three interferometers around the world where people are, are putting uh, quantum sources of light which have uh, intrinsically uh, much lower levels of noise than you could hope to get if you only knew about classical mechanics. And finally, people hope to simulate uh, quantum systems using a quantum computer. So, for instance, if you want to design a new kind of drug, the, uh, for, for medical purposes, or if you want to design a new sort of compound, 
uh, maybe a new sort of superconductor, solving those exponentially large number of equations which, you, which you're compelled to do uh, in order to understand quantum mechanics becomes substantially easier if you can use a thing that is itself quantum mechanical to do the job for you. Now, the, the, the underlying principle of quantum computing is that information is physical. So everything that, that, that people do in quantum information is really very close to thinking about what the underlying hardware is that one's going to use. And so I just wanted to, sh to show you so that you can keep in the back of your mind that the things I'll be talking about in the rest of the talk really have their embodiment in, in different physical systems. So here's a range of, of uh, different platforms that people are thinking about for building uh, quantum information processes. So there's, there's, uh, there's nu uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, which you might be familiar with from, from medical uh, applications. If you go and get your knee scanned, that's the same, same sort of device people are talking about here. There's semiconductor gadgets, the kind of quantum dots that I just showed you, the double dot where you can control the number of electrons falls into that category. And that's essentially using technologies that are very much like the semiconductor processing that goes on to build the chips inside these computers here but in a, used in an in application where you can control the quantum mechanical properties of the, of the electrons. People uh, in my university uh, think about how to build quantum computers using particles of light called photons moving around the place. Uh, there's other sorts of electrical circuits built around superconductors where, uh, again, one can, uh, can control the state of, of a uh, superconducting, a microscopic superconducting circuit with uh, exquisite precision. This is called a, a quantum electromechanical system. Uh, it's, a, it's a disk which, um, which can guide light in its, in, its, uh, in its perimeter, but it also vibrates quantum mechanically. So the mechanical vibrations of this thing can be uh, treated quantum mechanically, and you have the quantum of vibrations called phonons. And finally, on this slide is uh, uh, trapped ions and trapped atoms. So this is a little string of beryllium atoms that are brilliant ions which are, are held in a small trap and there's literally what one, two, three, four, four seven uh, ions uh, held in place and so in fact Griffith University in, in Brisbane has a lab where it, you can go in and you can go and see a single ion trapped in place. There's a, one of my colleagues uh, is in this business and so you can, go and you, can, you can go in and if your eyesight's good enough and the room's dark enough, you can literally see a single atom glowing. So, so you should keep that in those, those kind of things just in the back of your head, just that, uh, that people can build a whole variety of, of systems which exhibit fundamentally quantum mechanical uh, phenomenon. But, but what is quantum mechanics? So maybe I'll take a, a little straw poll here. Just put your hand up if you've heard of quantum mechanics. Now, put your hand down if you, uh, keep your hands up. Put your hand down if you, if you know what quantum mechanics is. Okay, uh, and, and uh, put your hands down if you can't write down the Schrodinger equation. Okay, good. So, so people here, uh, there's a range from, uh, I guess, lay interest to, uh, to some education about it. So that, that's great. So where did the quantum re revolution start? Well, quantum mechanics dates back to about 100 years ago. So at the turn of the previous century, people were uh, struck by a few fundamental paradoxes that they observed in, the, in, the, in, the, in experiments they had at the time. And so there was a period of about 50 years where people were, were, were really building up um, an understanding of how the physical world behaves uh, and, and some of the, the kinds of experiments that people worried about were, uh, were the photoelectric effect where they, they saw that, um, that it, it appeared like light came in particles uh, and, uh, and the Planck radiation formula where they, they, they couldn't calculate certain spectra of hot bodies uh, from, from the principles that they knew about at the time. But it took, took some time to, to, uh, to, to formulate what we consider now to be you know, modern quantum mechanics. But once that, once that got there, and I'll touch on some of those, those principles in a moment, once it got there, once we got to the, uh, the understanding of quantum mechanics that we now have, it was realised that there's two really quite strange phenomena which are, are, are at their heart counterintuitive. So the first is this wave-particle duality which you might have heard of. Now Richard Feynman was not the person who discovered it, but he did uh, articulate why it's, why it's uh, so critical to, to quantum physics. It's a phenomenon which is impossible, absolutely impossible, to explain in any classical way and which has in its heart quantum mechanics. In re reality, it contains the only mystery. 
Now this was said, um, uh, I guess, in the, in the 60s, at about the time when um, people were starting to think about this other property of, in a new way, another property of quantum mechanics called entanglement. So entanglement as a, as a concept was articulated by Erwin Schrodinger, who says it's, it's the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics. So I'll talk a little bit about both of these principles uh, uh, in the next few minutes. Again, who, who's heard of wave-particle duality? And who's heard of entanglement? Okay. So waves. Well, what, what are waves? Waves are you're completely familiar with. They're, they're, the, they're what happens in a pond when you toss a, a, a pebble in. And they also describe the, the uh, electromagnetic environment around us. Uh, this this could, could equally represent a, uh, the uh, radiation coming out of a, of, a, of a radio antenna. Or, again, water waves. Um, and waves have sorts of properties that you're familiar with. They can diffract through small holes. So here's a source of waves that uh, impinges on a, a sheet with a small hole in it. And, uh, and some of the waves, some of the energy in those waves propagates through that hole. But more importantly, um, if you have, for instance, two sources or you, you puncture another hole in this, in this barrier, you can get this uh, phenomenon of interference. So here we've got two sources, each emitting their own waves. Uh, each, each source is emitting a, a, a circular waves of this form, but where the waves add, you get constructive interference and, uh, and the waves, uh, the amplitude of the waves builds up. Uh, and in, in other regions where the waves are out of phase, they cancel out. And so you get destructive interference. And if you, if you go to the beach, you, you can, you can uh, really experience that. In the, these regions, you'll perceive the, uh, the the, the waves to be very uh, powerful, and in other regions you'll experience them as being, the water as being quite calm. But the other, other half of reality is the notion of particles. So that's, that's what we uh, think about when we think about something like this. It's a sort of particle-like object. It's a rigid body. It has well-defined position and, and momentum and so on. We can count them. And we know, uh, we know for instance, where, where they are, and uh, we can infer about where they might end up. Okay, this is this might be the Australian cricket team at the moment because it's missing the stumps. Um, so what is light? Okay, so waves you know about, particles you you're familiar with. What is light? Is it a particle? Well, or so is it a particle? Well, light does behave a bit like particles because you know it goes in straight lines, right? And you know that because look, see this this uh, laser point is. Uh, light's coming out here and it's ending up quite precisely there in a straight line where I pointed it. And Newton knew that, so he, he proposed the corpuscular nature of light. He suggested that light was actually made of, of particles. But uh, in, over the ensuing centuries, people became increasingly convinced that light, in fact, is, uh, is wave-like. And Thomas Young demonstrated the uh, double slit, or uh, so-called Young's interference experiment, which is exactly the one I showed you before. You have a source of waves, source of light, that can propagate through one of two slits. And what you see here is an interference pattern where there's regions of high intensity light and regions of low intensity light. So this is just the conventional interference effect you know about from water waves. There's some where the phases of the waves add up, you get large amplitude and large powers. And where the phase of the, of the, of the light uh, interferes, you get regions of dark. And so, so it was even it was known before quantum mechanics that there's 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 the potential to think of light in in two different ways. And the question is, is there a sort of Rosetta Stone? Is there a way to to uh, decode the the nature of light? What is it? So here's here's a, a little uh, representation of the Young's double slit experiment, where you uh, where you have a source of light that illuminates uh, two pinholes, and then there's a screen here where we observe that observe what happens. And again, I guess I've, I've uh, gone through this somewhat. So if, if, uh, if light is wave-like, well, you expect it to be, uh, exhibit interference. And if it's particle-like, you expect uh, just the arrival of the particles to, uh, particles don't interfere, that is, uh, where one particle ends up and where another particle ends up are sort of independent of one another. So you expect, if, wave, if light is like a particle, then you shouldn't expect to see interference. And in fact, what you do see uh, as Thomas Young observed, was interference. So light certainly does behave like a wave. But uh, sometime later, 
when people could start detecting uh, light in its, um, could, could start measuring the, uh, the smallest energies available in, in, uh, in, for instance, in photographic film, when, uh, when light arrives at a photographic film, it can be shown that it, uh, it arrives in little individual packets. That is, if you have a very low intensity source of light, maybe a candle, very distant, uh, very distant candle, and you expose some film, you see not a, a, a general um, uh, lightness of the, of, the, uh, of the exposed film. What you see is certain pinpoints where the light appears to have arrived in, in small packets of energy. The light doesn't just arrive in a diffuse way, it arrives in, these, uh, in this packet-like way. And so if you build a, a, a single slit experiment, that is you have a source of, of light that's very low intensity, then, then, light, uh, then, then the light from that uh, builds up in these small packets and, uh, and of course there's a single trajectory from, from this source to the screen and so you get a bright pinpoint of light at the screen. You can see here there's a, the other slits covered up. So what happens if you uncover the other slit? Well now there's two, two possibilities. The, the particles of light, which we know about because that's what arrives at photographic film when you develop it, you see these pinpricks of light. The light could come through this slit or it could come through this slit. So you'd probably expect, if you believed light to be particle-like then, to see just a bright streak here and a bright streak at this point. But what you see is is this interference pattern. So how does that, how does that build up? Well, as single photons from this source pass through these, this, uh, this region here, they build up over time and they tend to arrive more frequently at these bright areas and less frequently at these dark areas. So light is simultaneously behaving like a particle because it, it only arrives in, in these small uh, pinpricks. It doesn't arrive diffusely over the entire film. But over, over many iterations of this, uh, where, where you have very many photons arriving, you see them collect in regions of these bright streaks and, uh, and not collecting in these regions of these dark streaks. So there's something very strange happening. Light's coming in, in, in minimal uh, packets of energy, indivisible packets of energy, uh, and it's arriving nevertheless as if it were a wave. So what is light? So here's a, a, um, an experiment which really gets to the heart of, of, uh, of the nature of light. So here's a beam slitter or a half-silvered mirror. It's the sort of thing that you, you might uh, see in, uh, in cop shows, you know, where they're trying to spy on somebody who's, who's giving evidence. And uh, so, so it lets light, part, some light go through and it, it re has some uh, reflection as well. So, so light can be um, reflected or it can pass straight through. And if you build some very sensitive detectors, which are, are quite commonly available now, and you shine a particle of, li of light into, uh, into here, the, the light will, uh, the photon, the particle of light will arrive at one of those detectors or the other detector, and, and in the language of physics, we say those detectors go click, because that's uh, the nature of a Geiger counter, for instance. You know, you hear these sequence of, of clicks. And the probability of, of, one of one or other of these clicking is 50% for each photon. The photon uh, has a 50% chance of arriving here or arriving there, but that's just, uh, just like a, a marble that you fling at some stick that it can bounce one way or another way. So, so their light is behaving just like you would expect for a random part, a particle that's randomly being distributed one way or another. Light acts like a particle. So here's a, another experiment, it's, uh, same gadget here, um, and then there's a, a, a fully silvered mirror, mirror here, so it bounce, bounces the light up there, and then there's another half sil silvered mirror here. And on this, this branch we're just going to put a, an absorbing block, some black stuff here. And what happens? Well, if you put a photon in here, uh, there's some chance it'll be reflected and crash into here. There's some chance it'll uh, be reflected up into this detector and, and click there. Uh, and there's some chance that it will end up in the other detector. Okay, so, so these are the possibilities. And if you, if you do this experiment many times, you find about a quarter of the photons that end up here, a quarter end up here, and half of them end up here. Okay, so that's just what you expect if you're flipping coins at each of these at each of these. So if, at, at this, this point we're going to flip a coin and just decide did the photon go that way or that way. At this point we're going to flip another coin and say did it go that way or that way. So act, uh, light does behave like a particle. Well here's, a, here's a, a, just a slight modification of the same experiment. We're going to remove the block that was here. And we've got a half silvered mirror there, half silvered mirror here. So now let's just do another straw poll. Let's say, put, put your hand up if you think that uh, light, that this photon, if we put a single photon in here, it'll end up at, uh, at either of these detectors 
there's some possibility that it'll end up here or here. Put your hand up if you think that's what'll happen. Okay, that's a pretty good guess. What if, um, what if you think it will end up definitely here? Or definitely here, anyone? Well, if you do the experiment and you tune things correctly, in fact, you can, engine it, you can, you can uh, design it so that it always ends up at one of these detectors. No matter how many times you do it, the light always comes out this port here. Okay. So, so this, this you can do in the lab. You can, you can send a single photon in here. It's got 50% chance of going one way or the other here. You'd say it's got 50% chance of going one way or the other here. So on average, you expect half of them to end up there and half here. In fact, in the experiment, they can always end up here. Okay. So even though these are both flipping coins, in some, some sense they're correlated, right? So the, 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 the coin flipping conspires to send the photon always out one port. So that's kind of strange. How can a particle do that? Well, the answer is that uh, particles can't, but waves can. So, so this is, this is the, the wave interpretation. So we put a wave into this thing, and the wave's got... Uh, uh, some part of the wave is transmitted, and some part is reflected. And then the wave, th those two parts of the wave propagate along, and they arrive at this, this uh, beam splitter. And then at the, at the two outputs of these beam splitters, on one port, the waves uh, add up constructively, and on the other port, they uh, add up destructively. So the total power in the wave coming through here, if we just think about water waves, is zero, and the total power coming out here is all of it. So all of the light, when you think about it as a wave, goes in here and comes out here. So that's perfectly reasonable if you're happy to think of, of uh, light as if it's a wave. Question. Mm -hmm. Does the wave go faster than the particle, than the, than the photon? The wave and the photon are not different things. Okay. That would be strange. Uh, that's yeah. Well, well, let's let's keep going and we can have a chat. Um, so we've we've seen this picture. You know, you can send it one way or another, um, and uh, and so now we might want to let me. So we've seen we've sorry, I've just got myself lost. Yeah, okay, so, sorry, my slides have, have done something. So I, yeah, I guess what I wanted to show here, that, that you can do an experiment now where you, you play a trick on light. Um, so the light, let's say, we set, we set up an experiment, people have done this, you, you set up an experiment in which this block is possibly there or possibly not there. And you, you make these arms long enough so that light takes a long time to propagate through. And we're going to make a choice about whether that block lives there only after this photon has, has passed this beam splitter. So, so here's the picture. We're going to set it up so that the photon definitely goes, well, it goes one way or the other way. It's gone through this beam splitter. And at that point, we can make a choice. And the choice is we can put a block there after the photon's gone through here, uh, and, and if we do, then the, then the light ends up at, at these with 25% probability, as I said before. Or if we, if we uh, don't, if we remove the block after the photon's gone through, then we recover this picture where the light goes through. So it's not con the, 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 the experiment is a funny one because we're making a choice about uh, whether this block is here only after the photon has gone through there. So in a sense, the photon has to decide um, before the block appears whether it's going to behave like a particle or a wave. So it's not a particle and it's, and it's not a wave. It, at this point, it's indifferent, right? It doesn't know. And it can behave like a particle or a wave um, uh, depending on the nature of the experiment that you do. And people have done this, in fact, not just with light, but with all, all manner of particles. So electrons behave like waves as do atoms, and in fact, the largest molecule people have done this kind of experiment with is a buckyball, which has 60 carbon atoms in it. So people have built interferometers, this is called an interferometer, in which you see quantum behaviour of, of all these particles that we conventionally think of as massive particles. Now, electrons, you're in fact not unfamiliar with, that's uh, electron microscopy, and any time you see an image of, a, uh, of, a, of an electronic gadget where the feature size is less than uh, the optical wavelength, so if you see a, a picture of a, of a bit of electronic hardware where you're looking at things that are tens of nanometers across, which is the size of the electronic uh, elements inside this CPU, any time you see an image of that, it's actually because electrons are diffracting 
around those, uh, those metallic features as if they're waves. So the electrons in electron microscope are really behaving like waves. What time do I have to go till, by the way? Quarter past, is it? Okay. So, so this, uh, this, this picture that I've shown you, where, where you put a, a, a photon into a half-silvered mirror and it can go one way or another, if you think about it for a moment, um, affords a way to uh, encode information. So in a, in a, in a, uh, if, I, if I want to encode a bit, I can write zero or one, but that's, that's, uh, that's changing the physical state of a piece of paper. I've either written zero or I've either written one. Um, and likewise, the, the state of a photon, whether it goes on one path or another, uh, can be used to encode information. So, so you, you might imagine I'm going to describe the state zero by the, uh, the, the, the physical situation in which light goes through uh, one uh, along one channel, or one is when the light goes along another channel. You can also do the same thing for polarisation. So I could say a horizontally polarised photon, that is light that goes through sunglasses that are held in one orientation, is going to denote the zero state. Uh, light that goes through, uh, through sunglasses that are, that are uh, twisted by 90 degrees is, is the vertical polarisation. We might denote that as the one state. So the, the, the physical state of the light, which path it goes through, which polarisation it has, it can be used to encode information and there's a, there's, there's a variety of other properties of light that can be used also to encode information. When the photon arrives can encode information, the, uh, the shape of the photon can, can encode information. So, so whenever you think about information in, in, in this uh, quantum picture, you should really think about um, the possibility to, to represent that information in, in a variety of different physical uh, systems. So I showed you this already, that uh, one can build an electronic device where an electron can be localised on one side or the other of this, this little island. And that, likewise, can represent a bit, right? So if, you, if the electron were on this side, we could call that a zero. If it's on this side, we can call it a one. Um, and, and similarly, uh, there's, this, this is a cloud of atoms that a friend of mine uh, built in his lab. Uh, it's a cloud of beryllium atoms. And, each, and the internal state of these, each of these atoms can uh, take one of a variety of configurations and, and you can encode information in there. And here's uh, some other, other devices. This is a superconducting gadget, as is this. This is the mechanical oscillator that I was talking about before. Each of these things has been proposed uh, it, as a mechanism by which one can store information in this, quant this intrinsically quantum way. Just as I, I said, photons can be in a state zero or one. Uh, those, those things likewise can be in states that are uh, zero or one. Now there's this other, this other uh, notion in, in physics called entanglement, which Erwin Schrodinger first, uh, first um, originated in 1935. And what he was trying to get at with that, uh, that, that idea is that in quantum mechanics you can write down states of systems that um, uh, are inexplicable according to the laws of classical probability. And it's, it's very strange, it needs an analogy, and um, I noticed on, my, on the brief for my talk it was promised that I might make a joke about Schrodinger's cat. Um, so here's a cat and here's an atom. But you know, you know the, the Schrodinger cat story paradox is that we have a cat in a box and there's a, an atom here somewhere that decays. If it decays in some interval of time, it triggers a, a hammer to break open a vial of gas that kills the cat. Uh, and if it doesn't decay, then, then the cat, cat lives. So after some interval of time, is the cat alive or is it dead? And what we say quantum mechanically is that uh, we write the state of the, the system like this. So the, if there's no decay, the Sorry, this is back to front. If there's no decay, then the cat should be alive. Let's invert the thing. If, if it doesn't decay, then, then we've got some other trigger that uh, causes the cat to die. Um, this is the inverse Schrodinger's cat. And conversely, if there is a decay, then it stays alive. So, so I'm sorry, I've got those back to front. This is what we write down quantum mechanically. Now, this is a mathematical expression, um, but, but physically what it's saying is that there's some possibility for, for this to have happened, as well as some other possibility for this to have happened, just like light taking one path and or taking the other path. There's uh, an in infinity of jokes about Schrodinger's cat. Um, you can read some of those. It was promised that you'd get some Schrodinger's cat jokes, wasn't it? So I won't, I won't bother repeating them. You can, you can read them there. Um, now, entanglement's a strange thing. So uh, 
Einstein, this is Einstein with Herbert Hoover, the, the US president. Um, Einstein was, uh, was uh, obviously a very bright guy. And he, he believed that uh, this, this funny correlation that you could have a superposition, you could have a, a state in which something was both alive and dead uh, correlated with the state of this atom that had decayed or not decayed, he believed that that uh, indicated that quantum mechanics was incomplete. And what he said was that the, um, that there's some intrinsic, the, the fact that there's some intrinsic probability left over in the theory of quantum mechanics, that is, you can have a state in which the final outcome is not determined, tells you that, he, in his opinion, that, uh, that it doesn't provide a complete description of the universe. So, in Einstein's opinion, and it's a very reasonable opinion, a complete description of the universe should allow you to predict with certainty the outcome in the future. And he, he correctly recognised that quantum mechanics doesn't let you do that, which he felt was a flaw in the theory. That, that there should be some underlying theory that was more uh, complete than quantum mechanics, which would let you discriminate between the two uh, possibilities in the future of the cat being alive or dead. Then. Uh, a little later in the mid-60s, John Bell came along. He was a high-energy physicist, physicist in CERN, and he, he, uh, he realised that Einstein uh, had identified a really key... Uh, key had a very key the, Einstein's insight was key. So what Einstein believed was that, that quantum mechanics was, was some sort of effective theory and that underlying it, there was some what he called a hidden variable. There was some variable that those particles would have, the cat and the atom, would have inside them that, that would tell future experiments what, what reading to, to, uh, to have. So, for instance, then I, when I showed you the interferometer, the, the photon goes uh, with 50% chance one way and then another way, and then it recombines on another beam sitter with 50% going one way, 50% going the other way. But things conspire for it to come out the other, only one port. And, and what Einstein thought in, this, in these terms was that there was something about the photon, something inside the photon that kept track of, of which port it should come out in the future. And he called that a hidden variable theory. And, and he wanted to do that because in that case there would be some property about the photon, which maybe we don't have access to because we're not clever enough, that would, would somehow determine its future. And what Bell realised was that that uh, that there's an experimental, experimental test one could make that would distinguish that proposition that particles have this hidden variable which determines their future, just like you expect if I fling this uh, microphone over there, it's got a bunch of properties which determine where it will land. He, he proposed that, um, that, uh, that in fact there's, a, there's, a, there's an experiment that can distinguish between that, that no notion of a hidden variable theory which determines with, with certainty the future outcome of experiments. Uh, with what quantum mechanics predicts, which is that in some circumstances you simply can't predict if the photon is going to come out one port or the other. And he made, uh, he, he uh, cooked up a, um, a very simple uh, experiment, which I won't go into at the moment, which, uh, which would let you distinguish uh, whether a hidden variable theory was, was a possibility. Uh, and if the experiment turned out that way, then, then fine. Uh, we, could, we could continue to believe that things do behave according to some internal property. Or if they work out a different way, that is, if they work out in the way that uh, Einstein was incredibly uncomfortable with, it would imply that quantum mechanics is, is, is in fact not just uh, uh, correct, but actually also complete. That is, it provides a complete description. And in that case, it would suggest that either the hidden variables exist and something happens faster than, than light could, uh, could, could be responsible for. Some information is propagating at a rate faster than light. Or conversely, there's correlations that, are, that exist that are inexplicable uh, un, under the conventional laws of classical probability. And there was an experiment that did that in 1982 that established that uh, by Alain Aspect, which established that in fact it is, uh, that this is, this is the correct proposition. So either there's some signal that travels faster than light or quantum mechanics can't be explained with conventional probabilities. That is, he, he showed that what Einstein believed to be a fundamental problem with quantum mechanics was in fact its key strange property and it was, was, really, it was really the case that the laws of physics do not allow you to determine with precision what's going to happen in the future. Now, I showed you these, uh, these pictures of, of the nature of, uh, of um, uh, a single photon that could either be in, in uh, horizontally polarised, in which case we call it a state zero, or vertically polarised, in which state, case we call it a one. 
and, and with light, for instance, it's very straightforward to understand what we mean when we try and add these two things together. We, when we add something that's a, when we have a, a wave which is horizontally polarised and we superpose it with a, a wave that's vertically polarised, what we end up with is a wave that's diagonally polarised. That is, you add these two things together like vectors, if you, if you know what a vector is. Um, and, and a similar, uh, similar thing happens if you encode information in, in, the, in the, the, the position of the photon, whether it got, went, went along here or here. Although in this case, it becomes quite a, a tricky thing to imagine. What is it to add this thing to this thing if they're one photon? That is, what is the state where the photon has some probability to be here and a probability to be here simultaneously? In this case, it's very obvious. It just means that the polarisation of the light is diagonal. But in either case, in quantum mechanics, we write it, as I've shown already, in this mathematical form, which is just like adding vectors. So if you think about adding vectors, that's what you get here. A vector that's horizontal plus a vector that's vertical will give you a vector that's diagonal. So that's, that's what uh, gets written down. That gets called a wave function in quantum mechanical language. But what if we had two photons and we put those two photons into a funny sort of interferometer, a funny sort of beam slitter, where both photons would go one way or both photons would go the other way? Or perhaps if we're thinking about polarisation, both photons have horizontal polarisation plus uh, the possibility that they both have vertical polarisation. And this is a state which is entangled because now those two photons have, uh, they're correlated. So if we look at one photon, then we know for sure that the other, if we, if we look at one and we find it's horizontally polarised, we know for sure that the other one was vertically polarised. Conversely, if we look at them and we find one is vertically polarised, then for sure the other one's vertically polarised as well. But the two photons together are simultaneously in both possible states at once. And so this is really the clue as to why quantum information is special. So classically, it makes no sense to write this. If I tell you that a, a, a bit in that computer is in some hybrid state of zero and one, then you, you, would, you would say that there's been an error, okay? It's not, it doesn't make sense classically to, to talk about information being simultaneously in the state zero and one. And it becomes even stranger to say that two registers in a, in a computer can both be in the state zero simultaneously with both being in the state one. But that's really what happened. So, so let's think about what a, the state of a computer might, might look like. So classically, again, you can, you can identify bits as being in the state zero or one, and maybe we can picture that as being uh, something point, an arrow pointing up or an arrow pointing down, just pictorially. And a, for instance, a three-bit register can store one number, which can be any number from zero to seven. So we can store one n-bit number in an n-bit register. In, in a, in a, in, uh, if, if instead of classical bits you have quantum bits, now we can still think of the, the computational states as being zeros and ones which have these sort of orientations in this, in this, uh, this pictorial way. And we can add them together. We can add states together just like I described. So this would describe diagonal polarised light if this is horizontal and vertical. And this would describe circularly polarised light, things which you actually have uh, some classical experience of if you've ever used polarised sunglasses. But when you think about several photons or several quantum bits together, you can end up writing these kinds of states down. A single quantum register can simultaneously be in all possible configurations of three bits at once. Okay? Now that's, that's, uh, that's very strange. Okay, but nevertheless it's true, a, computer, a quantum computer can represent all possible 2 to the n numbers, an n-bit quantum computer can simultaneously represent all possible uh, states of a, of a computation simultaneously. Now classically this is the kind of gate that you think about at an elementary level, this is a NAND gate and here's the truth table, and in this case this is irreversible, so if I just tell you the output you can't uniquely tell me what the input was. In fact, classically you can build reversible computers, so you can build a gate which, uh, for which, whose output is, uh, is uniquely determined by its input and vice versa. So given each output I can, I can map it onto a, a unique input. And so you can in fact build reversible computers, classical computers. Quantum mechanics has, has an equivalent uh, uh, sort of gate. But uh, in quantum mechanics, everything, for, there's a certain rule which I won't go into, thing, the quantum computer must be reversible. So every gate in a quantum computer has to behave in some sense like this. That is, the output 
uh, is each output is uniquely determined by the input and vice versa. But in this case, um, there's another, another uh, requirement, which is that the gates must be coherent. So that is, if I put in two inputs, say in the state zero and zero, then the output for this control not gate is, is this one here. And you can see the truth table. The only important thing is that it does a not on the second bit if the first bit is in the state one. So it flips the, the second bit contingent on the value of the first bit. Now here, every output is uniquely determined by the input and also vice versa. But one needs to build this gate in a way that's coherent. That is, if you put in a, an, a state here that's a, in a, a qubit into one port that's state zero, and the other in this funny, uh, funny admixture of zero and one, then the output has to be this, what we call entangled state. So it's a special kind of gate that has to satisfy this kind of uh, this property. Um, now the strange thing is, as I, imply, as I implied earlier, is that uh, in, a, in, a, in a quantum computer, a 300 qubit state, if we tried to represent that in a classical computer, would require two to the 300 complex numbers. Now that's more numbers than there are particles in the universe. And so a 300 qubit computer is not, not, uh, not, not very large in principle. It could be something that fits in, on, side this, on, on the, this bench. If we were to try and represent the state of that with a classical computer, we'd need every single particle in the known universe. Um, and that fact means that there are, there are certain problems that, that uh, I won't go into the, the reasons for, but we can, in principle, solve exploiting this, this uh, quantum language of superposition and, and entanglement to, uh, to solve in a way that's more efficient than a classical computer. And now the, th these are the killer apps that I was in, uh, uh, referring to earlier. The, the first is, is factoring. So you know that uh, factoring is at the heart of, um, of uh, encryption protocols that we use at the moment. And it turns, so, so if you use a classical computer to try and uh, factor a number, uh, this is the, complex, the computational complexity, and it turns out that it's a, that it's a hard problem. Okay? The best factoring algorithm that we know of publicly is, uh, is exponentially hard. But if you had a quantum computer, the complexity of that problem becomes polynomial. So in principle then, if we had a quantum computer, you can factor arbitrarily big numbers in a time that's not unreasonably long. So you could break all the internet encryption that you're probably using right now. Uh, it turns out that search, there's a certain uh, way to, to phrase search problems in which you also get a speed up, not an exponential speed up, but you certainly get a, a speed up beyond the best known, the best, uh, provably best classical algorithms. It turns out there's a variety of other problems that, that, are, that exist in, the, in, uh, in simulating compounds, um, chemical compounds, which if we had a quantum computer we could do in a time that's, that's polynomial in the size of the problem we want to solve. That is to say it becomes tractable. Um, so so there, are, there are advantages, that uh, computational advantages that one can, can achieve if you can exploit this quantum, um, quantum these, these, these weird quantum effects of superposition and, and entanglement. There's a trade-off though, because quantum computers are incredibly sensitive to errors. Okay, so uh, this is from a, a paper that Google published, where they looked at the DRAM error rates in uh, in their, their their clusters, and they found that they were getting something like 25 to 70 thousand errors per billion device hours per megabit. And if you work that out, it's something like 10 to the minus 13 errors per bit per second. Okay, so that's pretty slow, the error rate, right? So. That's, uh, that's telling you that, that, that classical memories are incredibly well engineered. They fail only one in 10, uh, 10 to the 13 seconds. Each bit fails with, uh, with the mean time between failure of 10 to the 13 seconds. And, uh, and, only, uh, so, and about 8% of DIMMs were affected by at least one error in a year. But that's pretty amazing because DIMMs have got uh, many millions or billions of bits uh, in, inside them. But quantum computers need to be protected from errors because uh, whilst errors in a, in a classical computer take the form of, of a, either a, a bit uh, flipping from, let's suppose we wanted it to be one and flip to zero, or perhaps it, it simply can't take uh, one, of the, one of the states that you, you wished it to. So there might be some reason that it was, it's broken and it's always stuck on, say, the state zero. There's another possibility in quantum mechanics, which is that if some gremlin in the machine somehow manages to infer the state of this particle, and in the language of quantum mechanics, we'd say they're measuring that particle. Suddenly you collapse what we, this superposition, as we call it, into a probabilistic mixture. So now this, the, the system is no longer in a superposition, but it's in just a, a conventional probabilistic 
uh, mixture of with 50% chance being in the state zero, 50% chance being in the state one. That's just like flipping a coin. And with coin flipping, you can't do very much. Um, I'm really getting close to the end now. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just allude to the fact that there are uh, very uh, powerful techniques that are being developed now in quantum error correction. So they, they borrow from, uh, from the field of classical error correction, um, which, which was developed uh, for uh, classical computing, but in fact, by and large, is not really necessary inside that computer. But, but classical error correction is a well-recognised field, and there are uh, quantum error correction um, protocols that people have developed. Now, I'm well over my time, but I, I, so that's a really an overview of, of quantum mechanic, quantum information and quantum computing as it stands at the moment. People really are building quantum computers. You can, uh, in labs, there are uh, quantum computers with, uh, of the order of 10 quantum bits, and people can do, uh, do calculations with those. They're still very primitive compared to, uh, to, say, a classical computer with many billions of bits, but nevertheless, they do exist in the lab. Getting to the point where they become useful to solving, say, factoring or, or some of these simulation problems will require another factor of 10 or 100 quantum bits to be built with all the, uh, the quantum error correcting uh, infrastructure around, around that. But, but suffice to say, people are uh, well on the way to building quantum computers. Um, and I wanted to finish, because this is an open source uh, uh, conference, I wanted to, uh, to finish with a few projects in quantum information where, uh, where people are really trying to develop software uh, to control their quantum computers. So behind the scenes, whenever you build a quantum computer, there's error correction or there might be some other processing that needs to go on in a classical computer. And, and people have, uh, have, um, have been working hard at, at the kinds of problems that one would need to solve in order to run the underlying classical hardware that keeps the computer going. So I'm going to show you three, three different uh, 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 projects that people are working on. So. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of uh, uh, classical simulation technique called matrix product states. I won't go into the details. It's a graphical and, and mathematical way to represent quantum states. And um, there's a, a guy at uh, UQ, uh, Ian McCulloch, who's writing this software, Matrix Product Toolkit. And uh, so if you look that up on, online, you'll find um, this, uh, this, this, um, this software that he's developing. Uh, and, and it's a very powerful technique for simulating quantum systems, some restricted class of quantum systems on a classical computer. Similarly, there's another, another project, XMDS, which is, a, which is really a, a, a software package for solving uh, differential equations, um, so certainly ones that are, that are pertinent to, uh, to quantum mechanics. There's a Schrodinger equation, which is, which is the governing equation of quantum mechanics, and there's, there's a... This is just an example that's on there. So this is being developed um, by a chap called Joe Hope, who's at ANU, um, and, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's some way along the way to, uh, to being quite usable. And then finally, there's a, uh, before I finish, there's a, a, a package called LabScript, which is being developed at, at Monash University, which is really trying to um, open source the, um, the control of, of a laboratory. So, so given some uh, experiment that people might wish to do, the, the hardware that you need to control to make sure that all the atoms are where they want to be, need to be and where the, the photons are where they need to be and so on, uh, it can be incredibly complicated. If you look at, if you look at uh, one of the experiments that they build, they're, they're very large optical tables with hundreds or thousands of, of gadgets. And so there's a real uh, uh, problem with, uh, with ensuring that, that you can build a, an experiment that's repeatable and reliable. Um, and so these are just three uh, open source uh, problems that people are working on. And, and I'd encourage you to go and have a look at those if you're interested in, in participating, because I wanted to end just uh, to say that, that physicists are, are good at doing physics, but not necessarily great at doing software development. So, um, of course, we, we can, we can get things going, but they're often sticky tape and blue tack affairs. So uh, once the thing's built, it, uh, it works until you take the data and then you write the paper and then you go on to the next thing. But, but to go to the next step where you have a, a sophisticated underlying uh, en engineering um, uh, solution that, that is reliable and, and will um, let people uh, build on that work in the future is, is, uh, is something that, that we don't have the time or the skills necessarily to pursue. And so 
So I'd encourage you to go and have a look at these. And if, if, uh, if you're interested in getting involved in developing software for the physics community, working with physicists to, to write software, then, uh, then get in touch with me and uh, I, can, I can at least uh, start the conversation. So I'm over, well over time. Um, thanks for, for uh, having me and um, hope you've enjoyed your workshop. Thank you.